There we go. A new addition to the gym. <laughs> we got an Olympic platform. Yeah. All right, that's our little 50 horses. Wait, plugged in. At least 50 horses. At least. And where are we going to stick it, John? Well, it's going to be out of the way, aren't it? But it's going to be under the cover as well, though, is yeah, it? Yeah, we're going to kind of just swap it out for that. We're in a full tracksuit today. Normally I don't do this, I'll wear like a top and a bottom. So I never wear like the two together. It's just never been a thing for me. This is the Team McGregor tracksuit from the Mayweather camp. It's like cashmere. I just want to go sleep in it. It's real comfy. Anyway, I don't want to go sleep before I walk out. One of the classic workouts that I have not been doing is the old default for men, chest and arms. <laughs> and I'm going to do that tonight. I've been concentrating a lot on the Olympic lifting and now I've got that platform put in now. So it's completely different. The, the, the traction's different on the feet. It's all about getting the speed. Not that I, I'm very fast. I'm not, I've never been a fast switch guy. I've never been a sprinter or a kicker. But you can always improve on, on where you are by default. So I'm just looking to improve the speed. And I find this is great for strength and speed and technique and learning something new. So the chest and arms have been out the window. And I just thought, fuck, I'll just do chest and arms tonight. And I'm going to do a super set. I'll go through it and you'll see what I'm doing. But I'm doing each set, no rest, back to back to back. So I'll do chest, um, flat, incline bench that I'm on now. Then I'll probably do uh, pullovers and then bicep curls with a bar, bicep curls with a dumbbell, um, extensions with a tricep, and some, <laughs> some of them yokes. And that'll be one set. I'll probably do three or four, aiming for five, five sets, super setting, low reps, banging around. And then I'm a big tale to tell. It's one of my biggest stories, biggest stories that I don't usually tell because it's such a big story that even I find it hard to believe it happened. <laughs> but it's one of those, yeah, it's one of my big stories. So, yeah, we'll bang that out. Let's do a workout, get it done, get a beer, get some food, and then I'll tell a story. Right, I'm only going to do three sets. I want to wear myself out. <laughs> I can feel it already. So this will be my last set. It's got pretty warm, pretty fast. Quarter to nine, so I'm gonna do this bomb down the hill down to the, my sushi is open. Five euro tray of sushi and a small cold one to finish off. I'm gonna put on Ram Das. I am loving awareness. That's what you are. <laughs> And then, yeah, when it charges on a hundred, come on, TJ Osimo. Anyway, let's see if this uh, place is open still. My sushi, yes, it is. Ah, come on, the sushi. One miso soup, <laughs> one selection of. Sushi. Five euros for all that, look. And then one cold sagres. If you've got a chrome classic messenger bag, you've already got a built in fucking bottle opener in it. Oh, so don't let me down. As you can see. <laughs> That's it. 
Pop shit. Come on, son. You know? What sort of messenger are you if you can't open the beer? Come on. Really, there. Come on. There you go, son. Namaste. Cheers. So, miso soup, all that sushi, a cold beer. For eight euros. Look how calm it is, how still it is. No one around. Namaste. Alrighty. How we doing tonight? I'm drinking the Cristal. These little babies, 250 mils, small little baby beers, guilt free. Refreshing. Today, I'm gonna tell one of the biggest stories I have. It's, it's one of those stories there that sometimes I don't actually believe it actually happened. It's just one of those ones. So I decided to wear the cravat tonight. I bet the old Kangas on. So I thought I'd dress up for the story. So this one, I don't tell this one very often because it's, it's such a big story. And what happens is generally, I'll tell, I'll be telling a story to people if I've met them or if I haven't met them. And say the story is going well or they're really enjoying the story, I kind of get into it, you know. And what will happen is sometimes is the question arises, how did you end up in Portugal? And then I don't want to tell the story because it's such an unbelievable story that you'll probably think all the other stories I told you already were bullshit. <laughs> so I usually say, that's a long story, I'll tell you some other time. I never really get around to it too much, so a few people know it. But even when I say it, it's just, it's just one of those stories. It's the holiday home detective story. <laughs> and this would have, this is one of the few times I've ever said no. Normally I'm game. Normally if someone comes up and they, hey, do you want to do this call? I say, yeah, fuck yeah, let's do that. Let's see what that's like. Let's see what we can get out of it. But this one I said no. And I'm glad I said yeah in the end. But I just really wasn't into the whole thing. So it would have been about 15 years ago. And this is a story that kind of made all the other stories happen. This is, the, this is the, one of those big pivotal mo movements or pivotal moments in your life where... You don't realize at the time, but it's just a biggie. And I didn't really see it at the time. What happened was Julian, the doc, and most of my mad stuff's happened with him, actually. We've been, we've been on the road a long time together now, experienced all sorts of madness. But what happened was I'd finished riding the bike. And at the time, we, we were kind of living with each other in Africa, living with each other in Guadeloupe, in each other's hair all the time, when I had hair. And when I finished, I just didn't see him no more. Because we, all we had in common was the bike. And when the bike went, he wasn't the most social character. And, and at the time, I was start, I, I'd been par partying a lot, hanging out with it, kind of like the going out crowd, going out all the time out to nightclubs, out to the kitchen, out to all the kind of, well, mainly the kitchen, pretty much most nights of the week. U2's nightclub in Dublin. That was the scene, that's what I was into, that's what I was doing. Then I was done riding the bike, never wanted to look at the bike again. I wasn't doing too much fitness stuff. I was probably going to the gym, but that was it. So we didn't really have much to, to hang out with over. And he was socially awkward, so you couldn't bring him out. If you brought him out, you'd just be fucking, he'd be on the back of your head all the time because he, Brought him to a club, he'd be complaining about the smoke because you could smoke indoors then, or he'd have earplugs in, and he just couldn't enjoy yourself because it was like your special brother that came out with you and you had to kind of keep an eye on him, do you know what I mean? And he, <laughs> it was just one of those. So he rode over to the house one time, over my mother's house, and dropped in, and he, and he had this mad idea. And what he said was, he found this ad in the, the Sunday Independent, and it was a little quarter page ad, 
and it was called The Holiday Home Detective. It was RTE, we're doing this TV show. And it was the biggest prize RTE had ever given away. It was for an apartment for a quarter of a million euros or pounds at the time in Portugal. And he goes, we're going to go on this TV show and we're going to win it. And I just was not into it. And at the time, I suppose, it wasn't into being famous. I'd kind of passed that. I think when I was growing up, when I was a teenager and, a, and a, in my 20s, early 20s, I was a bit of a fantasist. I used to have this kind of like idea in my head that I'd be walking down the street and someday someone would spot me at something and go, that's the guy. He's going to be the guy. You know, I had this, I just used to have this in my head all the time. And I kind of got over that and I just didn't want to be, fa I didn't need to be famous no more. If you know what I mean? I think when you're trying to find yourself as a teenager in the early 20s, you're looking for that kind of like people to love you or people to like you or you're looking to value, find some value in yourself. You don't know what's going on and you think like, oh, fucking hell, what have I done in my life? And you've done fuck all really. <laughs> but it kind of like I'd moved on from all that and I was kind of happy with my own lot and I wasn't interested in being on TV, I wasn't interested in being famous, I wasn't, I just wasn't interested in that no more, it passed me by, I was just, I was interested in doing other stuff, you know. So he, he kept calling around and he kept going on about this show, he was going to, he'd written up a description for the two of us to put in for the, uh, for the, the application and, and I just, I was just, I wasn't even listening to him, do you know, it was just like, blah, 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 we're going to do this, we're going to do that and I'm going to put you in this, this and that and I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, Jules, whatever, whatever. And then, out of the blue, one day I get this phone call. And it's Julian. And he says, um, they'll see us tomorrow morning for the TV show. So I said, what, what TV show, Jules? And he's like, the Holiday Home Detective show, the one we're going to go on and win. And I said, I, I don't want to do it. And I was like, Jules, I can't, I can't go in the morning, I've got to walk. He says, right, okay, I'll ring them and reschedule. And I was thinking, grand, yeah, go ahead with that. Good luck with that, yeah. And um, because they were interviewing in Galway, Dublin, and Cork. And I thought, there's no way they're gonna. So that was that. I hung up. About two hours later, I get a phone call. And he says, Look, they'll see us. They'll see us tomorrow night at, at 7 p.m. <laughs> and I was like, for oh, fuck's sake. So right, I couldn't say no, you know what I mean? So so right, right, I'll pick you up. So I picked him up and he's wearing, he was wearing like three quarter lead trousers, a vest and this hoodie he had for years, it was like a zebra print. And if you know Jules, he has a wacky sense of dress. But if you know Jules also, he's a fucking unit. He looks like he's carried out a fucking marble. <laughs> and we pulled up the RTE and I was like, you're not wearing that stupid fucking zebra print fucking hoodie, take that off you. And uh, he did, and he just had a vest on, he's just like jacked. <laughs> and we walk in, seven o'clock, we're the last people they're gonna see. And I, you know, we'd put me down as a painter, him as a doctor, and we walk in, it was three boards on the panel. And when he walked in, they thought I was the doctor and he was the painter. <laughs> and I knew from the second that we walked in, we were gonna be on the show. I just knew. We just made that sort of an impression. It was just this kind of like odd couple. <laughs> and when we're leaving, he said like, okay, when, when, when's the first show? I said, no, no, we, we have to look at everybody and, and uh, see who everybody is and make a decision on who's going to be on the show. And he's like, yes, yes, but when we win the show, <laughs> he's like, that's straight off the bat, you know? So that was it. We walked out and I said, you know, we're going to be on this fucking show. And he says, yeah. Next day, phone call, you're on the show. And you know the way they have like archetype characters in shows, like they'll always have the, the kind of the mother and daughter and the father and the son and, and the two best friends and all this kind of stuff. And Brendan Courtney was the presenter of the TV show, who's this kind of camp gay guy, does a lot of stuff. And I said to Jules, Jules, I think we're the gay couple. <laughs> I think they have us down as the gay couple. And I thought we were, you know, that kind of way you just thought like, okay, wh where do we fit in here, you know? <laughs> I think we're gay, yeah. So anyway, 
the first episode, what the, what the whole show was, was they picked these teams of two, and you'd get a call, and you'd say, like, go to the airport tomorrow evening at six o'clock, and you don't know where you're going. You get on a flight, you meet two other people, they take your phones off you, they put you in a hotel, you're not allowed to leave the hotel, and you um, go and look at three properties, two on the first day and one on the second day. And you guess how much you think each property is worth, right? So whoever gets closest to the price of the property gets one point. So best day at three, goes on to the next round. So the first we, we got to the airport, met these two girls, I can't even remember the names, you know? It's funny how you just don't remember, like you spent the weekend with someone for, it was five days actually, um, and you just don't remember the names at all, you know? It was 15 years ago. We go away, they say, and they do it like, they, they did a lot of filming in the airport, so they went, okay, you're going to Mallorca, right? So, got on a plane, went to Mallorca. We had this system that we came up with. So what would happen is when you watch the TV show, it looks like the two couples are in the house walking around looking at the same time. But what it was was they'd bring one couple up, they'd keep the other one down on a van, go up and have a look, and then when they were done, you let the other two in. <clears throat> and me and Jules had this system where we would not talk to each other in the apartment in order not to influence each other. Because if I walk in, and I go, Jesus, this is an amazing apartment, isn't it? Already in his head, he's thinking hi. And likewise, he goes, it's a bit of fucking shit hole, isn't it? And you've already kind of killed the two approaches. And we kind of came up with this idea due to the two lads on the Muppet Show. If you ever watched the Muppet Show, there was two old boys that are up in the fucking, the gods looking down, and they'd see the Muppet Show do a performance. And someone would go, one of them would go, that's rubbish, rubbish, that's horrible. Yeah, yeah, that's rubbish, that's rubbish. Actually, it wasn't too bad, was it? No, it wasn't too bad. Actually, bravo, oh, bravo. They'd convinced themselves from it being shit to it being brilliant. And that's where we got the idea from, from the Muppet Show. More, more, less, less. And the other system we had was, we would not talk to each other, we'd go through it. And as, when we finished, I'd sit away from him and I'd get a pen and a pencil or a pen and a paper and he'd do the same. And we'd use a sniper, the sniper technique, the long range sniper technique. The sniper doesn't know whether it's 1,000 meters away or 1,200 meters away, but he guesses. And he guesses what's the furthest it could be, what's the shortest it could be. Let's go in the middle and we'll aim for that because the, 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 direct, the directory of the, of the, of the bullet does, isn't straight because the earth is curved, right? Unless you're a flat earther. The, there's a bend in, the, bend in the bullet from the distance. So he has to kind of guesstimate how far it actually is. So what we would do is use that tactic as well. So I would write down what's my, what's my lowest amount of money I think that the, the place is worth and what's my highest amount I think the place is worth and he would do the same, and then we'd, then we'd meet up, and then we'd discuss it, why I thought it was low, why I thought it was high, he'd do the same, and then we'd agree on a price, and then we'd go with that, and that was our system. And it was pretty much genius. We won the first round, went down for a drink that night, and we all got a great night, I just got on really well with the girls, I thought, this is great. Brenda Corney says to us, do you know, lads, if you win this, this could change your lives. And I said, yeah. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't, I wasn't really paying attention, but we were paying attention to what was going on. The next one we went to was Cyprus, and then we met the real gay couple. So we figured we weren't the gay couple. <laughs> and one of them, there were two middle-aged dudes. One of them was like, nice guy, straight acting guy. And then the other guy was just kind of like, 50-year-old, bitter, gay hairdresser. And Courtney didn't like him because he only wanted to be the only gay in the village. And we said, Let, let's ham it up for this, like, let's make it like a gay episode. Let's, like, let's start all ham it up for this. <laughs> and Courtney went nuts. He's like, no, I was away with these last week and they're horrendous. I didn't like them at all. <laughs> but I think what it was, was one of them, the hairdresser guy was just, 
he was one of these guys that was envious of youth and the fact that everything that he was based on was based on how he looked. Everything that he was based on was based on youth. And now he couldn't get the young boys anymore because he was starting to get old. And then he just hated everyone that had something that he didn't have and was slipping away from him. One of these type of characters. So we went to Cyprus and there was one time we were out and we were having dinner and he called me a pie ball. And a pie ball for you, for my American <laughs> and Brazilian, <laughs> which is, is a Irish traveler, is an Irish gypsy's horse. It's like a mixture of all sorts of horses. So I took offense to it. We're all having dinner, the crew, you know, the producer, the director, the camera guy, and they're all sitting around. Your man's kind of trying to press me buttons. Didn't like us. Trying to press me buttons. He called me a boy ball. So I said, um, you better back off now or I'll drag you across that table and they won't be able to use you in the second part of the afternoon for TV. They'll have to get a stand-in or a very good makeup artist. <laughs> I'll show him up. <laughs> but when they lost, you had to do a bit to the camera to say, like, what you thought of the other couple. And we went first. And we said, look, they were nice lads and wished them well and all that. And he went on with his bitterness. And he went, I hope they knew us. They were horrible. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Bitterness and envy everywhere, isn't there? Made it to the final. And it was in Portugal. And we'd been kind of like studying part of Portugal as in the prices of properties and, you know, just got embedded, we'd about a week to go. We knew it was in Portugal, they told us it was in Portugal. And we just got embedded and studying how much places were worth. Because like, where I'm from, Dublin, you've got like, Hote is on the north side, but yeah, Hote is expensive rather than um, Darndale or somewhere like that. And Crumlin's on the south side, but it's cheap compared to somewhere like Fox Rock, you know, it's just, so we kind of like, kind of, had a good look around and, and we weren't too sure where we were going to go and stuff like that and we, we, we came across like a few little places and we studied a bit on Lagos and then we studied a bit on different places, Albufeira, um, Amansil, Quinta, all these places. And But what we did was we paid attention to where we were all the time. Like at lunchtime the other, it was a father and daughter couple and um, she had just been recovering from cancer and all this kind of stuff. And I think they wanted her to win for the kind of the good luck story. You know, sorry she had cancer and stuff, but I'm here to fucking win. She already had a house hijack shit. So what happens is they're on, they've been drinking during lunch, but me and Julian are paying attention to signposts. We pulled up onto this place called Funchal and I knew that everything on Funchal were, were, were villas, like soul villas, bit of space. And everything was between 1.5 and 1.8 million. I just knew that. So when we pulled up and we stopped at the bottom and you see Funchal, I'm like, well, it's just gonna be in the middle of that, isn't it? It's gonna be 1.7 million. <laughs> That's what it was. And we banged it on. And then we went to another place. And we got that on the money as well. And what happened then was, I don't know what happened, but that night we were, we were happy because we looked at two properties and we knew we were pretty, pretty much, pretty much bang on. We knew we had it wrapped. We knew we had it won. And we knew then all we got to do is get up the next morning, have breakfast, go in, get close to the next one and fucking take the money and run. So that night we were 
I don't know, there was something going on. I didn't know what was going on. They had a mind there in us. They wouldn't let us out of the place. And it was all a bit like, the fuck's good? you know, it just it all seemed a little bit cagey or sketchy. And the next morning was an emergency meeting. So they flew in the executive producer. And he came in and he called the meeting. And he goes, what you filmed yesterday is now null and void. We're going to shoot three properties today and do it all together. And then your woman with her father had a bit of a breakdown. She was all hysterical. I was pissed off. And then Jules said, look, let's walk off. So I'd, let's have a chat. Now, here's one thing about Jules. Jules can be the most best person ever, most annoying person ever, funniest person ever. But when it boils down to you, he will go through fire for you. And he will back you up. He will walk if you want to walk. doesn't matter how much is on the line. At the end of the day, we always end up pushing bikes in the rain. So he says, has a chat with me. So he goes, here's what we're going to do. We signed a contract for one euro. The contract said you will see two properties in one day, one property in the second. That is all. They were in breach of contract. We'll go down. We'll smile and laugh, let's do it all again. And we'll win it again. And if we don't, we'll fucking sue them. <laughs> so I said, right. So we were all on down, all like happy as Larry. Yeah, no problem, let's shoot three more properties, kill. Yeah, null and void, let's go. And they were like, oh, I can't do it again. And I was like, you've just got a fucking second life. We'd already won. And now you've got to go again. So we took the three properties. And then that night, they shoot the scene of uh, the announce it live, you know. <clears throat> and I remember going down, we so, shot the three properties, I was kind of happy enough how it went. Um, and we were in this kind of like apartment, and they had a, a minor where it couldn't go out, same shit again, right? And then Jules comes into me. And we have this little agreement. And we say, if this thing doesn't go our way, let's just wreck the gaff. <laughs> On set, it's just fucking run amok. <laughs> so he goes, all right. <laughs> a better man to run amok with. Fucking hell. He's been at the, uh, he's nearly got me killed a few times. So it's all, fuck it, yeah, let's lay. Yeah, if they're going to fuck us, let's fuck them. Fuck them. So when we, when they call out the, you know, the best of three was one all, and then they call out the winner. And the winner of the 250,000 euro apartment is Colin and Julian. And you just see me and Jules going, well, me anyway, I wasn't stoked or excited or any of that shit because I thought, like, okay, what's the fucking catch? Where are we going to focus? <laughs> and we won. We won. A 250 grand apartment in the Algarve. <laughs> now that's a fucking story. <laughs> now that's a fucking story. It's great. And it all worked out well. He ended up moving here. He ended up getting the gym here. Connor ended up coming down. I ended up being on the road with him. And Courtney was right. It did change my life. The biggest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. <laughs> That's my biggest story. But like I say, it's one of those ones where I didn't want to do it. And then when I did it, I just got fully committed. Me and Jules just played a fucking storm on that. And that's the fucking, that's how I got here. Just like that. <laughs> Ten years later, I'm still here. Not going anywhere. Loving it. Loving it. So I hope you enjoyed that story. It's one of my better ones. If you've never heard it before, 
It's just one of those stories. It's a big fish story. You know? <laughs> Went on a TV show and won the biggest prize that RTE ever gave away. We are all one. Hare Krishna. Namaste. Hashtag Rafter. Rafter. So, next week, Colette and Philip will be meeting fitness fanatics Colin and Julian in our grand final. And one of those teams is going to win a quarter of a million euro apartment in the Algarve. Will you be coming with us? We certainly hope so. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.